Hello all, my Tom Baker era video recently hit a million views. I'd like to thank you all for your continued engagement with my films. It's a great source of pride and vindication that you enjoyed and continue to enjoy the fruits of my labour, and it's very humbling to have such a large audience now subscribing or stopping by and leaving such overwhelmingly lovely comments. My plan was always, first and foremost, to collate all this nonsense in my head into something entertaining yet comprehensive, and I'm so honoured to have shared my love of Doctor Who with you all. I'm hard at work currently on my Brigadier companion video, and will soon start the writing process for part 12. But in the meantime, to celebrate this fantastic milestone, I thought I'd edit together a little behind-the-scenes glimpse into the process I undertake to bring you these films. From time to time I have people inquiring about the technical side of things, so if you've ever wondered what kinds of work go into something like my videos, I hope you'll find it informative. Having been a dedicated fan of Doctor Who going on 30 years now, I already have a ridiculously vast bank of trivia and minutiae to draw upon when planning each instalment. In order to broaden this, however, and ensure that my references are accurate, I refer to material I already own and invest in new material to fill in any gaps. The reading of this helps to put the flesh on the basic bones I've already noted down. This is probably the longest process as I need to set aside a decent amount of time to write the script. Some parts flow like wine, sometimes it's like pulling teeth, but eventually the scripts get completed. For the earlier episodes, concerned as I was by running time, they tended to run to about four to 5,000 words, but more recently this has now expanded to about nine to 10,000. At some point I'd like to return to the earlier installments and update and expand them, but that's for a later time. Once I've proofread the script and ensured I have added anything I may have missed, I then record my narration. For this I use Cool Edit Pro 2.0, which I've used for about 20 years now. I could use a more up-to-date piece of software, but I'm so familiar with it now and its ability to do exactly what I need it to means that I still fire it up when I get to this stage. Hardware-wise, I use a simple Blue Yeti USB microphone with a pop shield to filter out some of those awkward plosives and some sound dampening tiles behind to reduce echo. Reading all that text takes some time, but I then have to spend many hours listening back through, applying some filters to take out any extraneous background noise, editing out mistakes, and most importantly, getting rid of intrusive breathing. The vision episodes, the parts of the track have silence applied and are then trimmed to ensure the pace is appropriate. Vision episodes, the series made efforts towards media saturation. Now the full voiceover has been recorded and prepared, it's imported into the visual edit for which I use Adobe Premiere Pro. The voice track acts as a spine on which I then begin to build the final production. This requires assembling images from the internet or scanned from books and magazines. Many of these images require some touching up before use. It bugs me when I see unrestored images in documentaries when a few simple processes would provide a much better and more striking appearance. Most images sourced online, especially older images, are scans of physical prints on which a whole host of artefacts such as hairs, dust and damage like scratches can be seen, so I spend some time ensuring these images are cleaned up as best as possible in Adobe Photoshop and contrast corrected before importing them into the relevant section of the video. Sometimes I also cut out sections of the images and save them as PNG files so that I can build up composite layers with depth. For the early sections of each video, I rely heavily on such still images, so in order to make them more visually interesting, I apply so-called Ken Burns effects by adding movement, zooms and dissolves. This is very much a trial and error part of the process, where I improvise what I think will look good and preview the edit until I'm relatively happy with it. Video clips are either sourced online on YouTube or recorded from my own collection. For this, I tend to use VLC Media Player, which allows me to manually record clips from DVDs. For high definition I need to use some extra equipment, but I haven't done too much of this yet so I won't go into the boring details. These clips are then inserted onto the timeline and trimmed to fit the relevant sections of the narration. This usually revolves around finding the specific section I wish to draw attention to at the end of a piece of voiceover, placing this on the timeline and then extending the footage back over the section. The volume then needs adjusting to ensure the background sound isn't distracting. I prefer to fine edit as I go rather than building it in stages from a rough cut. There's pros and cons with both approaches, but I find my method works best considering the structure of my videos. The music is sourced from the collection of soundtracks I've gathered over the years, or sometimes purchased for use in the video. Since the beginning, I've always selected tracks used during the specific era I'm looking at to maintain the mood and tone of that particular period, but which tracks I select depend on the emotion or atmosphere I'm trying to reflect in a specific section. 
How long this whole process takes depends very much on the complexity of any particular part of the video, but on average it takes about an hour of editing to produce a minute of the final screen time. After the visual edit is complete and final titles are written, I then watch the full video to check pacing and sound, and then export it ready for upload to YouTube. During this time I tend to put together the thumbnail, which entails sourcing the main image, usually the respective doctor, cutting it out and layering it onto my standard background with some blending effects. The exported video is checked through one more time to ensure nothing's gone wrong in the process before it's uploaded to YouTube, with a description and chapter selection composed. The video is unlisted at first because the automatic content ID bots will immediately flag my video for possible copyright infringement. At least one of these flags, but usually about eight or nine, will automatically block the video from being seen worldwide. As this is an automatic process, I then dispute the claim, which flags the video for manual review by the copyright owner, in this case BBC Studios. In my dispute, I explain that my videos are for the purposes of review, and that I do not intend to monetize them. After 48 hours, the content ID blocks automatically release the video, and it can be published for everyone to see. Bar one or two instances, the manual review has always changed the consequence from a block to a monetization restriction. Technically, the claim is upheld, but the consequence is changed to one I'm happy with. And that's the lot. It's a lot of work, and being a single creator who undertakes the whole process, and with a full-time job to juggle alongside, it can take a great amount of time. But I always try my very best to bring you all the most polished and entertaining end product I can, and it's very rewarding to receive such appreciation to that effect. I hope you found this informative and enjoyable, and I look forward to bringing you my next project very soon.